Star Trek Into Darkness. So, tonight's two hour and twelve minute movie is going to be just what the title says. The, this is like going back to the original Star Trek characters uh, with Captain Picard, no, not Picard, Captain Kirk and Spock and who's the, the doctor? Bones. Bones. Chekhov. Chekhov. Uhura. Uhura. That's it. <laughs> there, we get to see the young versions of all of them. And also you could say that some of their personality traits that were pretty common in that first year, you really get to see the, the character development because they go back. This is their they're young. When Kirk hasn't had his first kind of being the captain, he's he's still aspiring to do that, and um, and, and that yet they know each other back then. And I, there's like all kinds of, I think some of the, all of the major themes we were talking about loyalty today. There's there's all kinds of beliefs in friendship and loyalty, and we were talking about no people pleasing because Spock is. Mm. Is very logical and is not really in touch with emotions, so he's, mm. he doesn't seem to filter or censor anything around trying to not hurt anybody's feelings. He's just straight out there with everything. And the contrast between that and, and James Kirk, who he's pretty much like, you know, don't, don't worry if you break a few rules, it's more of what you're going for than the concern about breaking rules. So he, he will cut corners or break rules or s stress the truth they say or bend things and so on and so forth. And he seems to be the much more passionate one at the beginning and the one who, who will you know, stick his neck out or cover for somebody, you know, if, if it protect them in some way or whatever. So it's actually, I just think that this is a, a great, um, among all the great Star Treks, this is really good. I saw it in 3D and I thought it was amazing graphics. And, and also the, there's a character in there which they, who seems um, to be pretty far advanced in their eyes, but he, they just have this hunch that they can't really trust him, but they don't seem to have any options. So, it's one of those things, like we just watched um, the draft day, where it was about working through compromise. I think this is another movie of working through compromise. And, and I think in draft day there was some pretty good striking contrast, but nothing like this. I mean, Spock and Kirk, as far as two main characters, you know, in a series, they're, they're kind of at opposite ends of personality, so it creates some fi really fantastic dynamics <coughs> at trying to get at what's what's real and what's true underneath the the duality, the perceived duality and everything. So it's quite an adventure. Is everyone buckled in? <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's going to put her seatbelt on. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got the remote, right? Yeah, if you want to just yell out, pause, anything. Okay. Right. Great. Hey, very good. I hope you caught those lines at the end to mm -hmm. purpose to remember who we once were and who we must be. That was, yeah, that's the whole purpose. And then right before that, there was the talk about, it was really aiming at the forgiveness about while we're sleeping, really not getting into destroying those that like seem to mean as harm. That's, that's where the temptation of the world, the temptation to perceive somebody's attacking us, when really they aren't. It's just the attack thoughts in the mind make it seem like there are people and people that are attacking other people. It's just a giant projection of attack, which really is the, the underlying belief that you could attack God is not in awareness at all. 
so all people perceive are the wars and and the, all the dramas of people physically and psychologically seeming to attack each other every day, which is what the news is filled with every day. But it's not showing what's really going on in the mind, it's just protecting this attack thought that you can pull your mind away from God. So it, that was really a pretty profound kind of line too. Maybe we, we could even run it back to get the exact line. It came right before the remembering who we once were and who we must be kind of thing. But it was really that, it was like not, he was giving his talk, you know, his speech, but it was like just the best you can not give in to the temptation. And it fits with that movie that we saw yesterday about um, Days of Future Past, where they're so tempted to react to what they perceive as this attack and defense thing, even when they have to come back into the past, back in the 1973, they go there and pretty much um, the Charles character, the one played by Patrick Stewart, is saying, I'm not the man that you know me as now, like, <laughs> I didn't have my powers back then and I'm just not the one, you know, he, he had a lot of um, seeming pain and hurt and about losing his, his leg, the use of his legs and, and about um, the character that, I don't know what her name was, that Jennifer Lawrence played, mm. the woman that was kind of blue. Yeah, I can't remember her name. He, he had a lot of misgivings because he felt that, that she had kind of left him and gone to, with Magneto whatever that character was. So, there was all these grievances just festering, and all this immaturity, and then sent back into all that, like, which is what we could call planet Earth now, is, <laughs> this is 1973, and this is like, because the mind is so tempted to, you know, give in to the belief that someone can be hurt, and then the belief that something has to be protected, mm -hmm. something has to be defended, I know that in, in this seeming parable of David, that's what kept arising and arising and arising all the time, is this idea that of protectionism or wanting to defend something or wanting to, you know, see something in a certain way. I, I loved it in this movie and also in uh, Days of Future Past where there's this sense of, um, even the ones that seem to be lost, the ones that seem to turn away. I love that in this movie how, um, you know, Kirk makes the decision to just let Scotty go. You know, Scotty's like a very valued member of the, the crew and he's got to make a decision to just say them go and to appoint Chekhov. So he has, that's one of his own, his own family he had to let go of. And then, you know, it, it's kind of interesting that just when he's needed most, you know, Scotty's drunk <laughs> and, you know, and having his conversation with his little mate, the, the funny looking thing. And so he's got to come back, he gives him the coordinates, he, he has to say, what's the third number, you know, <laughs> he's pretty far gone. But he's never lost, he's never out of the picture, you know. It's, and I think the same thing was in that Days of Future Past where, you know, it seemed like um, that certain characters were kind of spinning out, like the Magneto character and and uh, Jennifer, it's been Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. Yep, she was spinning out. And and during our time, you know, we've had different ones that seem to spin out, spin out in different ways, but to not lose focus of the purpose. You know, like the purpose is to remember who we were and who we must be. The Christ, you know, that's like the, the main thing underneath it all, regardless of how things seem to play in form, mm -hmm. to not get caught into interpreting the form mm -hmm. in any way. So really it's don't interpret anyone staying or leaving or spinning out or staying true. And all these different temptations are really just temptations to misperceive, to make it seem personal. personal to make it seem not the moment, which is just that it's all simultaneous. And that's, that's what I liked about 
you know, that days of future past. And it seems like the Jennifer Lawrence character finally had to let go of the the grievance that was all centered on her letting go of the grievance, so that the like there really is no future. That's just a a projection of the past. But as long as you hold on to the grievance, then it seems like the past isn't the past. It seems like it's still active. It's still happening. And there's still an impetus to try to change it, to fix somebody, to control something, to defend something. You know, that's where the the temptation comes in. Instead of just to see it as it is, completely whole, you know, with no problem whatsoever. Like there's never been a problem in the field. In forgiveness, there's never there's no problems. So that's why when we had that question yesterday, you know, if guilt is hell, what is its opposite? And we kind of started going through, couldn't be innocence because innocence doesn't have an opposite. And in that sense, metaphorically, it, you might say that the opposite of, of hell, which is distorted perception, is healed perception, which is what forgiveness is. It's an illusion too, but it's, it's a necessary acceptance of, of an illusion that that is the healing illusion. You have to, you can't go from distorted perception back into reality because it's too big of a leap. It's just too, it's too far, it's too much. There has to be something in the middle, even if it's an illusion, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it, ha it has to lead you away from the rest and that's the, the forgiveness. That's, that's what the whole focus is on the miracle, forgiveness, and of course the atonement is the is the ultimate of forgiveness, the first miracle, the last miracle, and all the miracles in between. It's really, it's the forgiven world, it's the happy dream. It's the real world that Jesus talks about, just, it's the healed world. It's the world that's unified, it's, it's simultaneous. That's what heals the world. If the problem is linear time, the solution must be simultaneity. It would have to be. There couldn't be any other solution. It's still, it's still got the time idea, simultaneous time, it's just meaning everything seemingly is happening at once. But that's a more accurate description, that's a forgiveness description of time. But the ego tries to make it linear. And that's something that all the great teachers, you know, and saints and mystics have taught. <coughs> It's something we are focusing on and emphasizing in all of our teachings. It will become more and more the central teaching that time is simultaneous. That there's really, the past is gone, the future is but imagine, total escape from the past, total lack of an in interest in the future. This idea, the trick of cause and effect, which there's been so many teachings that have come through on reversing cause and effect, but actually coming to start to see that there is no cause and effect in this world. And that's, that's what the ego is most resistant to. It'll be all kind of intellectual defenses, all kind of, that's not practical, that's too, too big of a leap and whatever, but that's actually what this is about. I, I had some old teachings on that and I remember Jeffrey, Jeffrey Lake one time, he, I think I did one called Reversing Cause and Effect, which is just, a step towards seeing that there really is no cause and effect in linear time. And he said he, he played that tape or that session over like six or seven times before he could even start to, the resistance to, to recognizing that is enormous because it's so simple. It's like it, it, it wipes out every conceivable problem in terms of the way the ego makes it because the ego made up separate cause and effect. That there's causes in time and there's effects in time. Whether it's around the body or the world or economics or science or any way, it's all part of a giant scheme to, to keep in place this idea that there are causes in time and then effects that follow. So this happens, then that happens. And that even down to f like f physics, for every action there's a reaction. That's not true either. That's Newtonian, we were talking about.
Jessica landing. Isaac Newton. No, don't tell me. No, that's like that's like getting to the most core. He says, you know, no, it's all simultaneous. Ah! <laughs> we could do a nice little animation on that. Just because everyone seemingly on the planet, most everyone has been raised with Newtonian and it's the quantum that's been around for like going on six decades and still it's not catching on after six decades. You know, it's that much resistance. We're still teaching in a lot of classrooms, they'll probably teach Newtonian and then they'll put a little, maybe a some, some paragraphs, <laughs> a little dab of quantum at the end because it's like the rebel, <laughs> the rebel science. It's still like Newtonian, Newtonian. We're, we're more exposed to quantum, you know, because it's a reflection of where our mind's at, but, you know, it's quite amazing. Quantum loves tours. <laughs> yeah. Quantum supply runs. Quantum supply runs. <laughs> so going to, like Joe was saying, feeling a little guilt going in to the pantry and getting offered all that food. That's quantum too, you know. It used to be the days of St. Francis, they'd be out there hacking away most of the day, you know, trying to harvest mm -hmm. grain so that they could bake some bread and, you know, or working for others who were doing it, hoping that they would get thrown some bread. Now we go to the pantry and it's like, <laughs> it's, like, it's huge, but that's quantum, you know. That you're not earning a living, you know. You're not earning anything. Neither do you have to start to put your mind into trying to think about earning a living. How rare that is. How quantum that is. You know, to be able to be free from that. That seems to be like so pervasive that it seems like there's millions and millions of people acting out that that trick yeah. and just trusting. Whether you seem to have no money or, or no debts or whether, like Jessica's had to have the faith that in, even in the faith of, in the face of seeming debts, quantum, it's quantum <laughs> physics baby. <laughs> Love radiates undefined. You got it. That that song is like really <laughs> a theme song. You know, like in the face of whatever it is. You know, again, it's like they had to do in this movie. They had to really keep the faith. It seemed like one danger after the next, danger, 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 danger. But that's of course how the ego keeps the mind trapped by throwing it out as if there's linear time dangers. And the only so-called danger to peace of mind is believing in linearity. That's, that's dangerous to peace of mind. Yeah. Not in reality, but in terms of waking up and sleeping. It's like you don't want to hold on to that belief because then you'll just have nightmares. You know, whether it's your, your daytime dreams or your nighttime dreams, there's going to be characters in there that, where you seem to be a character, and there seem to be other characters, and those other characters don't mean you well. <laughs> they, they, it's kind of, it can be shocking, you know, it can be very shocking. You might get some really good teaching dreams in there, but, but then the occasional one will come in of, of betrayal or abandonment or rejection. Kind of like that movie that, um, with that um, Mel Gibson was in, what's it called, Braveheart. Some of you might have seen that, where he goes all the way to the end and he's, you know, his wife gets it and everybody gets it and he's got this one that he has so much faith that he can trust. Robert? Something like that. And then when that character turns out to be the betray, betrayal character, then it's, you see it in his face, it's like his heart yeah. seems to be crushed. And that's what happens, that's what gets enacted out in so-called romantic love relationships because there's this sense of you and me against the world or that there's somehow a partner that's going to be the one that's going to stay true. Mm -hmm. And then, then it's shocking, it's like a literal shock to the system mm -hmm. when that partner doesn't seem so to like expectation yeah with anything, yeah really. expectation with anything including like with a partner where 
you know, like I think of that movie. I remember seeing Braveheart, and you know, you follow that movie, and it's like the Mel Gibson character keeps the faith, keeps the faith, keeps the faith, keeps the faith, and then boom, when this character turns out to be, you know, untrue or unhonorable or betrayal and so on and so forth, and that it's like it seems to crush his his state of mind. But that's those are just one of those things of another temptation. All that is, is another temptation to believe in linear time. It's nothing more than that, you know, if you pull it back. That's just, it's just a misinterpretation to believe things in a linear way. Just a total misinterpretation. It has no validity or reality whatsoever. And yet, everything in this world, that's the baseline, you know. Mom and Dad and society and whatever, sports, and, and, and all the things that are valued as really, like, important, like family. You know, it's not seen as totally impossible. Not that it's bad, but it's, that it's just absolutely impossible that there could ever be a linear family. It's absolutely possible that there could be a linear country. You know, when everybody likes the John Lennon song, Imagine, Imagine there's no country, you know, nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of men, you can feel the heart chords going. And, and really, imagine there's no country, you know, or even imagine there's no heaven. People would put that in there, they, oh, I wish he'd left that out or something. No, you, it's not, heaven is not part of the imagination. And if you try to imagine country or heaven or or partnership, or anything that you can come up with in the imagination that's linear, it's not that it's bad. It's not that it's wrong. We might say it's wrong-minded, it's a misinterpretation. But, it's, but what does wrong-minded mean except, in the end, impossible? Wrong doesn't mean wrong as we've thought of it. It just means impossible. It's just absolutely impossible that the linear time could coexist. Jesus says, time and eternity cannot coexist, and you might even take one more step and say, simultaneous time and linear time cannot coexist. One is an accurate perception, and one is a misperception. And even though they're both illusions, neither have anything to do with <laughs> eternity, simultaneous time or um, linear time, it's the simultaneous time that's closer, it's in closer alignment. Mm -hmm. And when it says God will take the final step in the Course, that God doesn't take steps. God doesn't, oneness doesn't take steps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Humans, maybe believing they're waking up, can seem to take steps, but God does not, it says that in the Course, God will take the final step. All that's doing is putting it in, again, in human terms, but what the meaning of that is, is God will take the final step, really is that creation just simply is. We say God is and we cease to speak. That's what creation is. It just is what it is. Back there, it has no opposite. It's just eternity. It's just pure spirit. But it's beyond the curriculum. So that's why our focus is always on forgiveness or atonement or simultaneous time. And even our movies, like this one, or Days of Future Past, it's kind of cute that an adventure, they're sent on an adventure to go back to the past, to find the forgiveness, mm. to make the correction, and then when they do seem to do it, the whole crazy dark world just completely, all the, basically the characters disappear mm. from it. It was kind of neutralized. You know, they just, it wasn't like it looked, it, it, it just basically the characters all, all were gone. And so, I, I wouldn't say you would look, you could look for forgiveness in the past, but, but you can allow the Holy Spirit to take you into an experience of simultaneous time. That's, you cannot wake yourself, Jesus says, but you can allow the Holy Spirit to wake you. And that's just allow your mind just you have that be your desire, just have that be your single focus, your single purpose, to experience 
simultaneous time. And and put faith in nothing else. You know, like a, be very single-minded to have that singularity of that one purpose, just to experience simultaneous time. And nothing else matters. You can literally laugh at everything else from simultaneity. Uh, in linear time, it's more of like, a, it's a little bit of distorted humor. You, you're laughing, but underneath it's like you're crying. <laughs> yeah, it's not really full-blown Holy Spirit humor. Simultaneous humor, that we could do. That's why it was funny when we were talking about Jessica going back to Isaac Newton and Copernicus. Because it, it's the, it was what was being taught, the simultaneity, that is the funny part. And it's even funny the thought that someone could resist, oh. you know, resist simultaneity. That's, why do we laugh at that? Because that's what's happening with everything. Whenever anything happens that seems to be serious, it's not serious, really. Nothing is serious. <laughs> That's a quote, we'll put that on Facebook. <laughs> Nothing is serious. Or what's the one that you put in your mix? You literally are your brother! <laughs> You're not your brother's keeper. You are your brother! Yeah, that was from... Blue Mountains, yeah. oh, flashback. <laughs> or that part in the I Need Do Nothing section where Jesus says, your way will be different, instead of like long periods of tedious, time-consuming meditation, mm -hmm. contemplation. A holy relationship is given you as your means of saving time and salvation. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on to describe what a holy relationship is. Mm -hmm. You and your brother are together. That's his explanation of holy relationship. It's just saying, mm -hmm. time is simultaneous. Mm -hmm. He could have just as well mm -hmm. said, time is simultaneous, but he said it in terms of his course framework. You and your brother are together. It's not that you're, you're not forgiving somebody else. It's like you're, you're releasing the belief that there are, are people. Mm -hmm. That you're a person, mm -hmm. that they're people. That's what's simultaneous about it. How could persons exist in, in simultaneous time? If all the images are there, all there together and, and always have been, then there's really nothing fragmenting or breaking apart. And, and multiplicity has no meaning. No meaning. There could be, duality has no meaning, but certainly in, in multiplicity it has absolutely no meaning. And if there's no multiplicity, and there's no linear time, then what does the word more mean? Remember that part in the Beyond All Idols section? Mm -hmm. Jesus starts it off with, what is an idol? Do you think you know? Mm -hmm. An idol is for more of something. It does not matter more of what. In simultaneous time, there is no more. Mm -hmm. No more. And I always keep talking about that Psalm, the 23rd Psalm, the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Where does wanting arise? Then your time. But if everything is simultaneous, what could wanting mean? What would wanting even mean? Wanting or wanting more, what would that concept even mean? In simultaneous time. More of what? If everything is simultaneous. But it keeps linear in place. It, it's a sneaky device that's so valued in linear. More. Bigger, better, more. New, improved. Brand new. You know, that's what all the marketing yeah. is in terms of the product placement. The Truman Show. More, 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 more. More is the future, really.
You know, the gateway to love is through simultaneity, it's not through more. Years ago, Kim, Kim Carnes did a song, More love and more joy than space and time could ever destroy. But still, it's not, there's not, it doesn't make any sense, more love, more joy. What could that even mean? <laughs> you see how trick, tricky, 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 yes. tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, Jackie showed us, when we were away, she showed us some of these again videos, the one about duality and non duality. And Lisa was talking about, um, you know, the world doesn't change, like it still seems to be chaotic and like messy, what she called it. And for me, I didn't actually, until I heard that, I didn't realize that I had that like fantasy of, oh yeah, you know, on this path, while opening up my mind, this, this is going to get better, and it's not going to be messy anymore. And that was really important for me to watch that and actually like have that disillusion with that, because mm -hmm. it was always about, oh, it's going to be better, it's going to be smooth, everything's going to be, you know, it was still about the form being in a, a certain way, mm -hmm. and that was also that linear time thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually realize how stressful that concept still was to like hold on to that still. It's better, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be better, you know. I'm doing this work so it'll get better, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what a trick. Yeah. Oh, she's great. This is <laughs> this is cool. She's yeah. so much like fun to yeah. watch and like join in her mind. And, and then it was like it was a slight like feeling of I couldn't quite understand what I was feeling. It was just like something in there I didn't like. Mm. And then I realized a few days later yeah. that that concept of oh that dream is not going to come true. Yeah. Fantasy isn't going to yeah. happen. Maybe. Yeah, like smooth is an interpretation, and smooth, <coughs> you could say, could be the Holy Spirit's interpretation if it's harmonious and easy and everything, but, but that doesn't dictate and define form. It's quite the opposite. It's like when you go into everything flowing, f be in the flow, the capital flow, things going smoothly, that's all a very, 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 very high interpretation of it's all simultaneous. That there's no things aren't ever going to get better. <laughs> that always sounds so funny on earth, <laughs> but 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 that's presuming that things are the way that they aren't. The very mentality that says better. It's a song. It's pure bliss. Doesn't get better than this. It doesn't get better than this if you really if you really open your heart up to what this is then you can actually sing that song, It's mm. Pure Bliss. Mm. It doesn't get better than this. This being the present moment, this being simultaneous time, this, it doesn't get better than this. There is no better, because there is no more. There's nothing else but simultaneity. And that's what, you can feel it more, like with Lisa Cairns, you can feel the vibe. There's a joyful, playful, laughing, happy, vibe that comes from that, and it's not understandable to linear time. Linear time goes, mm, it's a bit suspicious mm -hmm. of that joy, or that happiness, or that laughter. It's a bit suspicious, mm -hmm. you know. It will try to, linear time is always trying to dispel mm -hmm. that, that joy and happiness, cover it over, go back on emphasizing the past and the future, and covering over the present moment, almost like, a, that's mm -hmm. not real, reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cuz it's it's actually a state that goes beyond the opposites. That Lisa was saying that her teacher, her teacher slash boyfriend Roger, you know, it, it was he was he was very articulate and he seemed to always have the right words and and could could describe things and this and this and and yet 
the only way to feel and be and experience it is to see the absolute impossibility of linear time. There's, there's not a way that, it, it, then everything falls apart. The idea of intellectual, what does that even mean in simultaneous time? There's, or the head versus the heart, you know, people say, don't live in your head, live in your heart. What is that? There isn't a head and a heart in simultaneous time, in the present moment. Those are artificial constructs or, you know, just trying to, you, in that state of mind, you, there, it doesn't oppose anything, so there, there's not a making wrong with anything. So somebody could say whatever, it wouldn't be a, a like an energy of making wrong, it would be just a joy. Oftentimes it's just a watching that you don't really, there's nothing to say or do. It's just the presence is so strong, and that's the answer right there. You know, that it's the state of mind. It's not, there aren't any intellectual answers, and really there aren't any conceptual answers at all. Which makes it fun. Once you just have that experience that there are no conceptual answers to anything, you can have so much fun. You could, you could have Stephen Hawking's, you know, the one, all of this and that, some of this most recent things. I, I was reading recently, somebody said that he definitively came out, it was, oh it was in that uh, God's Not Dead movie where basically, I guess Stephen Hawkins, this highly, highly, highly respected astrophysicist was basically, was dispelling the, the notion of God, you know, and, and, and saying that, like using gravity, is an example that gravity invented itself. Mm -hmm. And then the guy who's in God's Not Dead just started to point out through different philosophers and everything that that's just circular reasoning, saying something came into being because it created itself. And that was like the reasoning, that was like the core defense, and it's like, that's the exact thing that we're being shown that, that um, that you can't create yourself, and that you can't get something from nothing. But that ultimately spirit is everything, and spirit is creative, and so everything is spirit. And like Mary Baker Eddy said, there's no mind in matter, there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence in matter. All she was really saying is, there's no spirit in linear time. So we don't have to have sacred sites and sacred avatars and sacred people and this and this because there is no spirit in linear time and all those things are of linear time. Now simultaneity time, that's, that's, that's as close as it gets to, to spirit. That's not even spirit, but what a joyful, happy, loving, peaceful perspective that time is, is simultaneous. You know, that's everything. This happy little presence within you that's <laughs> to everything of linearity, because it's not so. Not because it's wrong, <laughs> because it's not so. That's the Holy Spirit's humor. Not, it's, it doesn't condone anything or make anything wrong, it's just <coughs> because of what it is. Yeah, I actually feel that that's, that is the Holy Spirit in your mind, is doing that. I, the Holy Spirit is so placeful in my mind that, that there's this sense of, um, you know how, how we like jingles and music so much? 
that the Holy Spirit will do that very thing. But for me now, it's it's always like in a song, yeah. and it's that's a very direct way. Like like I'll I'll just be there and I'll I'll just. I'll just be started, be serenaded by the Holy Spirit. Dream, 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 dream. You know, it's the beginning of a very, very, very famous song, but there's so much joy behind that, and it's all we got one word really in it. It's like a. Yeah, there's there's a number of. Them. Oh my god. Yeah, that will help you check out in <laughs> That little song will check you out of time and space really quick. <laughs> all collapsing into that one one experience and I just saw yesterday I think that they they had these two writers and they were reminiscing with these two Star Trek writers two guys because these two writers were writers for Star Trek Next Generation mm. with Picard and you know all of the data and all the they were very famous so it was the first generation which Captain Kirk and Spock and you know, Sulu and all of these, and then there was this next generation, and then of course Deep Space Nine, and you know it continued on. But but they got to the f they got to the point where they were going to do a finale, a season finale, and the end of the Star Trek Next Generation series. Years of absolute magnificent stuff that JP and Jason have been pulling from. All these great, great, great episodes and making many movies and uh, you know mind meld and well we've got so many of them. If you just watched them, they're they're just amazing tools. But they got to the final, the final uh, episode and the the producers said, okay, well we're going to have a final episode, but it's not going to be an hour. We're going to wrap it all up, all those seasons of Next Generation with a two-hour season finale, and you're going to write the two-hour season finale. It's got to be good. It's got to be real good, because <laughs> we're ending this next generation. I think it was like six or seven years it was on. No pressure, but, <laughs> uh, you know, you've got to write, these two guys, you've got to write the season finale. And they said it was spectacular. But not only did that happen, but that was the time when these Star Trek movies, like the one we watched, was coming along. And they said, oh, and by the way, we want you to write this Star the next Star Trek movie. And they were given that task simultaneously, mm -hmm. to write this, this, the finale for the next generation and a whole new Star Trek movie. And they did it, these guys. I had, had their picture. I guess it was like, the, yesterday was the anniversary of the end of the Next Generation, so they were reminiscing, and, and they had not even viewed that last episode in all these years. It was so, they were so in the moment, doing it, writing a whole movie and doing that, and then, for them it was just, I'd, I'd say it was channeled, you know, and that's what we're doing here. We're literally, every single day and every single moment, 
where this is channeling spirit. And it may seem to be around what the world judges as mundane things like going to a pantry run or, you know, strapping up something, moving su supplies, we call them quantum supply runs. You know, those are everything. Those, the whole universe is right there in that simultaneous, it's the feeling, the experience of the supply run, you know, where you're just in the joy of it. It's not a task that being done for somebody else or for the future or whatever, it's like everything is right there. That's your Star Trek movie today. <laughs>